these technologies were developed in partnership with the Department of Energy and Oak Ridge National Labs to ensure that the U.S. leads in AI. So together with Oak Ridge and HPE, we're setting out to bring leading edge AI and compute in a matter of just a few months to the DOE and Oak Ridge. And it's expected to bring 3x the amount of AI performance compared to what is on, on site today in a matter of a few short months. And that's Advanced Micro Devices CEO. The company and the Department of Energy announced a $1 billion partnership to build two supercomputers capable of harnessing extremely large amounts of data to tackle America's most challenging scientific problems, energy solutions, and national security. These computers are expected to deliver three times the AI capacity of any supercomputer currently on the market. Gentlemen, now with this historic deal is Energy Secretary Christopher Wright. Secretary, great to see you. Thank you so much for being here. Congratulations on this huge deal. Does this mean that the U.S. Energy Department is investing a billion dollars or is AMD investing the money? Where is this billion dollars coming from? The direct capital is coming from AMD. What we're providing is the data center. We've already got a computing center there and we're just adding new machines into that machine into that data center and we will run and operate the machine. So we will we were certainly sharing part of the financial burden. But this is just a perfect example of a public-private partnership when we want to move fast. We don't want to run a two-year procurement process and then a two-year build. AI is moving fast. We need the government to move fast. This well, is President Trump bringing common sense back to Washington and the benefits roll in. Absolutely. This is a huge deal, and I know that the demand behind this is really what this is about. As you know, I'm just back from the Permian Basin. And what I learned on the ground in the Permian Basin is that we've got too much natural gas to even actually handle because we don't have the pipelines in place. Now, natural gas is going to get you to the electricity that's going to get you to fire up these data centers and meet the demand of this AI boom and this AI revolution. Can you talk to us a bit about what's going on in terms of the pipeline process? Because many of the executives that I spoke with told me, Secretary, that they have natural gas that's coming out of the ground when they're drilling for oil, and they don't have the deliverables to actually send that natural gas to where it needs to go. And we need it badly, but they're selling it at a loss because of the uh, limitations on pipelines. Maria, you've hit the nail right on the head there. And natural gas is just an amazingly abundant resource. And with the American shale revolution, we can produce it at incredibly low costs. It's 25% of total global energy and over 40% of American electricity. We have this magic that can make our economy hum, that can bring us a better future. The question is just infrastructure. You have California in New England that have extremely high energy prices, not because they're unlucky, not because they don't have resources, just bad political choices that have prevented basic infrastructure to be built and deliver it. Most of the rest of the country wants low-cost energy. They want data centers. They want economic development. So you'll see a lot of pipelines built during this administration. Some of that Permian gas you just saw near southeast New Mexico, it'll power data centers and manufacturing in southern New Mexico. It'll go out to Arizona in a few years, and there'll be giant semiconductor and data center developments there. It can go all around the country unless politicians stand in the way and block their citizens' access to low-cost energy. Um, you should run this same story in California and New York State. We need to get pipelines built so we can bring low-cost energy to the six New England states and New York State. Why not? Can you, can you characterize the amount of money that's being directed toward AI right now and the kind of demand that you're seeing from an energy perspective? We're going to speak with NVIDIA CEO Jensen Huang tomorrow, Secretary, and I'm going to ask him where the return on investment is. And from your standpoint, this enormous amount of demand to power up AI and AI data centers is really creating a pivot, a, a, a new revolution for this economy. How would you assess that demand right now? Are we going to see a return on all of this investment? Somebody said we're talking about ultimately spending three to four trillion dollars on the infrastructure around AI. Could that be right, that number? It certainly could be. We'll see a few hundred billion uh, dollars invested next year. So, yeah, in five or ten years, could you get to a few trillion? Absolutely. But, like, energy is what makes everything in life possible. It empowers modern medicine, transportation, more efficient manufacturing. 
What, we used to have 80 percent of Americans work in farming. Now that's less than 2 percent. That's energy enabled and fish efficiency. And this is perhaps the greatest ever use of energy. We can turn energy and, as you just saw, low cost, abundant energy into intelligence. Who doesn't want to have more intelligence? more skills to develop drugs faster and cure cancer, develop new energy sources, develop new efficient ways um, to make your life better, longer, healthier. I mean, it, it's tremendous opportunity. The, we, we live in a technological golden age right now, and this is a golden age that would be flourishing in China and not in the U.S. if President Trump had lost the election and we still had energy squelching policies and we were trying to hold Americans down. This is what unleash American energy, unleash American entrepreneurship looks like. Yeah. I could not be more excited. Well, it's very exciting. I agree with you. And I want to get back to California in a second because Exxon is actually suing the state. But let me stay on the economy for a second because we don't have any data uh, to look at in terms of assessing this economy. I just spoke with the chairman and CEO of Bank of America, Brian Moynihan, who gave us a good assessment of the consumer. But in this dearth of data because of this government shutdown, Secretary, here's, what, here's the headlines that we do. UPS is cutting 48,000 management and operations jobs. Uh, Amazon was expected to cut 30,000 jobs. They this morning come out and said, no, we're cutting 14,000 jobs. Uh, and, and again, these are corporate jobs. What do you think is behind these job cuts that we're seeing from a handful of companies? Is this an indication that the economy is worse off than we thought? I don't think so. Both of those are in the shipping and transportation of good sectors. And think what happened during COVID, right? Everyone stayed home and everyone bought everything online. So Amazon and UPS ramped up massively to adjust to that new, sec that new way of people that bought goods. And of course, things are drifting back to normal today. So I think those are normal corporate adjustments. In fact, both of those, and particularly Amazon, are going to be just massive beneficiaries of AI. They're going to be more efficient. They're going to drive down the cost of goods even more. So, look, when you have new technology that enhance efficiency, of course, where people work moves and changes a little bit, but the net benefits will be overwhelmingly positive. Yeah. The average American worker is simply going to be more productive. It's that means more income, more opportunity. Yeah, it's a great point. And I, it also gets me to look at the state lines, right? Because you go to Texas, which is where we were in the Permian Basin, and you're seeing a great progress of deal flow and you're getting gro growth there. But you just go to New Mexico, a couple of miles away, and you've got completely different state lines. So how is that uh, sort of putting a wrench into things here. You've got ExxonMobil suing California over the state's climate change disclosure laws, claiming that they violate the First Amendment. FoxBusiness.com writes this, both laws require ExxonMobil to comply with California's greenhouse gas protocol and task force on climate-related financial disclosures, which the company reportedly claims forces it to take blame for global warming, Secretary. This is the Energy Department is cutting funding to multiple Biden-era projects, uh, the latest being $700 million in battery and manufacturing projects for clean energy solutions. Can you do it all on the federal level? Because when you're talking about the rules and regulations from state to state, that is definitely hampering growth for some of these oil producers that recognize oil and gas arguably is our number one most important natural resource here. Absolutely. It's 72, 73 percent of the total energy consumed in the United States comes from oil and gas. It's a record high ever. The Obama administration, I mean, the Biden administration passed $2 trillion of monies aimed towards fighting climate change. Oil, gas, and coal were 82 percent when they arrived and 82 percent when they left. A lot of money, a lot of regulations, a lot of laws. It doesn't move an energy system. California actually gets a greater percent of its energy from oil and gas than the rest of the country. But yet this political posturing, all this noise about climate change, they're not doing anything about climate change. But they are making energy massively more expensive in California. California gets two-thirds of its oil imported from the Middle East. America is a net oil exporter, but not California. What does that mean? Higher gasoline prices, higher home heating prices, less jobs and opportunity in California. Common sense has got to return to the West Coast as well. 
California should be the land of opportunity, but state government, bad politics, bad regulations have just made things tougher on Californians. Yeah. So, yes, state governments matter, not just the federal government. In, in terms of growth, is Permian as important as Alaska? You took a trip to Alaska to survey the situation there as well earlier this year. Oh, the Permian is the most important oil field on the planet right now. So massively important, the Permian Basin, for both oil and natural gas. Alaska has huge, maybe has even more growth opportunity in front of it. And um, the Marcellus Shale, the natural gas that's in Pennsylvania, it's also under New York State. They mm. could develop that, too, and drive energy costs down for New Yorkers. Great point. So, Maria, I love you covering it. It's, it's it's not about luck. It's about political decisions. That's what determines the price of energy and the range of opportunities available to citizens. And do you worry that you're not going to see new investments in the ground next year because oil prices have come off of the highs? Um, you know, of course, prices are cyclical. Supply and demand will swing yeah. that way. But we'll see record American oil production next year, a huge growth in American natural gas production next year as we grow our exports to our allies and build data centers here. So, no, I'm bullish on the energy business. But the better it gets, the lower prices are, and everyone wins from that. Secretary, it's great to see you this morning. Thanks so much. We'll keep following it. We appreciate your time. Thanks, Maria. Energy Secretary Christopher Wright. We'll be right back.